setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Be seated. Your friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Who are you going to believe, Zedekiah? Zedekiah, king in Jerusalem, in a horrible time in the history of God's people when they were being threatened with total destruction. Who are you going to believe? Hananiah, the prophet telling you that things are going to be okay, going to be over quickly, and you can make an alliance with Egypt, and Egypt's going to save you from the Babylonians? Or Jeremiah, the prophet, warning you that it's going to be a long, painful tough slaughter, and you need to trust God, and you need to not resist Babylon, but to accept this time of suffering as God's will for you in this time and place. Well, kings like Zedekiah don't always choose wisely. My father-in-law told me, growing up, he had an older brother. And between the two of them, he was faster. So when something would happen that they knew they were going to be in trouble for, they would run for their father, and he'd get there first, and his story got out. And his brother would get punished. Robert said that with a chuckle. Zedekiah chose wrongly. He listened to the prophet that he wanted to, to hear. He listened to what he wanted to believe was true and not Jeremiah. But Jeremiah had done his job. He had spoken God's word. He had spoken the truth to God's people. No matter what the king did. But unfortunately, didn't stop there. 
It wasn't enough that Jeremiah and what he was advising the king didn't prevail. There were some in Jerusalem so upset with him, they had to do away with him. They plotted to have him killed. He was, um, there was a big cistern that they, they captured him and put him down this cistern and he had to be rescued by his friends and allies. And somehow, he wasn't expecting that. He expected opposition. He expected that there would be people that not, didn't like what he wanted, to, what he was saying. But he was amazed that the people who he counted on and whom he trusted, some of them his family, were so bothered by what he was saying that they participated in a plot to get rid of him. And this lesson from Jeremiah we have pulls no punches in how he felt about that experience. He cried out to God, blaming God for fooling him and in calling him to be a prophet. I want to see your retribution upon those who have brought this suffering upon you. If we are going to be on God's side, if we are going to do something for God, that is the thing that is um, hard to understand and deal with, that sometimes it involves suffering. I know as a young pastor, I was scared of criticism. I had this idea that there were some pastors out there that were so confident and good at what we do that they were above criticism. Myla and I spent a couple of years going to, to Nazareth Lutheran in, in Cedar Falls when we were students at UNI. I cleaned Homer's office. I looked up to and admired Homer. And I thought Pastor Larson was above criticism in how he went about and, and did his ministry. I was in awe of him. And I thought that was the way that if I could somehow only be as, as competent as Pastor Larson, I could be above criticism. And, of course, I'm not Homer Larson. Don't have anywhere near the, the gifts and abilities that, that he has in, in being a big church pastor. And so I've not been above criticism. I've had to learn how to deal with it, to hear it, to understand it, and to cope with it. also to recognize that it's always going to be painful. And that there are some feelings that are going to come up with that that are unpleasant and unchristian to tell you the truth in some of how I respond to that. That's what these lessons are, are from this morning. To be aware of that, to be aware that being a child of God does not exempt one from suffering in our families, in our congregations, and in our communities. I sometimes tell our church leaders when we get some criticism and complaint and people are unhappy, that's a natural thing. If everybody's happy, you aren't doing anything. If you're doing something, if you're trying to accomplish something for the Lord, somebody's going to be upset. 
I read recently, and I was surprised by this, uh, one of the professors, I never had him, but he was a professor at seminary when I was there, Gerhard Purdy. He wrote about preaching that unless some people are saying amen and other people are saying BS, you aren't doing, you aren't preaching. <laughs> if everybody agrees with you, if everybody's happy about what you're saying, you're not preaching the gospel. Because the gospel arouses opposition. It arouses something when it's said in the way that it needs to be said. That of the sinful self, that no, I don't want to hear that right now. Because it's doing some business with the part of us that resists God. Suffering is a part of being a child of God and living out our faith. So what are we going to do with that? First thing is to remember, Christ has triumphed. The grave couldn't hold him. The tomb is empty. The Apostle Paul says in Romans, I believe that we are more than conquerors. The victory has already been won over sin, death, and the power of the devil. That is the good news that we come to celebrate this morning, that we come to praise God for, that God raised him from the dead and overcame death, sin, and the devil. The bad guys aren't going to triumph. The rulers and the, light, the rioters and those who would tear down people's livelihoods for no other reason than their own unhappiness are not going to triumph. Bad guys are not going to win. So what do we do? We turn back to God. We release those who have afflicted us in life into God's hands. And we recommit ourselves to doing things God's way. That's a hard lesson to learn. One that I continually have to learn in my life to let go of, of some of those bitter feelings and, and some of the, the hostility that can cling about things that have happened in the past, that happened to all of us, to let it go and to be free from it as I forgive those who have sinned against me. Apologize for those, to those who, who I have sinned against, who I have harmed with my actions and behaviors and to recommit to following Christ, to witness for him, to do things the way Christ would have me do and to be God's person where God has called me to be. And that's the same calling for us as a congregation and for you as, as followers of let go of the hurts and animosities of the life. To apologize for things that have, you may have, have gotten wrong in life. And to turn back and live in the grace and the goodness and love of the kingdom of God that is ours in Christ Jesus. Let us ever walk with Jesus, hymn number 802.